so the Queen comes to New Zealand. 12,000 miles from the motherland, she is not among strangers. She has come to her New Zealand home. Presented by the Governor General, the Prime Minister and his wife, Mrs. Sidney Holland, pay their respects. It's the first time in history that a reigning monarch has visited these shores. Saluted by a guard of honor drawn from frigates in Auckland Harbor, the Queen is acclaimed by her people. Her Majesty's first thoughts are for the sick and infirm, and at the very outset of her stay, she visits Auckland Hospital. Those too weak to line the streets thus see their Queen, and none more closely than Lieutenant Colonel Volker, CBE DSO, who last year spoke to her from Korea in a Christmas broadcast. HMNZS Philomel is the naval base at Devonport on the northern side of Auckland Harbour where the Queen presents her colour. Here are memories of ships and men of the Royal New Zealand Navy who have served the Commonwealth well, in all waters from Jutland to the River Plate and the Pacific. From seaborne might to airborne power, and to the many who have inherited the traditions of the few. One pilot in every 12 at the Battle of Britain was a New Zealander. During four long years, there was never a month when less than a thousand of our pilots were training in Canada. Christmas Day, the first the Queen and the Duke have ever spent away from their own children. The gifts are in greeting from the women of New Zealand, their happiness to have the royal couple in their midst. So to St Mary's, the historic wooden cathedral church designed by a Canterbury pilgrim. They are at one with their people as they enter the house of God. A friendly people, a green and pleasant land. Through Northland, where the first settlements were built 140 years ago, the royal cars head south along 1,300 miles of the Dominion's highways. That New Zealand's interest is not confined to history and farming alone, the Queen is now to discover for herself as she explores Waitomo. We follow her as she reaches its famous limestone caves. A strange, ageless world draped in a delicate tracery of stalactites, perhaps the finest spectacle of her entire Commonwealth tour. The Karapiro Dam is an example of state hydroelectric enterprise, one of ten great stations planned for the harnessing of the Waikato, the Dominion's longest river. One million horsepower is the ultimate aim. The Duke sums it up accurately in sign language. On the river Waikato, my people prepare to welcome their royal guest. With raised paddles, they greet her in the Maori royal salute. Our sentinel warns of her coming, and in Arawa Park, we watch as she reaches the Marae, our appointed meeting ground. She cannot cross it until first a ceremonial challenge has been made. This is our custom. <laughs> the dart must be picked up as a sign of friendship. Now the Queen is our guest.
Queen Victoria gave us the flags. Now they fly for her great, great granddaughter. Our bishop, the Bishop of Aotearoa, clothed the Queen in a feather cloak called a korowai. Now she is indeed our chief. She belongs to her Maori people. Guide Rangi tells Her Majesty of the legends behind the carvings on the Ware, our meeting house at Whakarewarewa. It's not an old Ware, but is in the true Māori tradition. It's part of a model pa, or fortified village, which shows how our people used to live. I think Rangi has also told of the legends about the waters which boil in the earth nearby. Heartwarming demonstrations of loyalty from farmer and townsfolk alike transform the tour into a triumphal progress. A portent of much more to come as the train moves through the rich sheep raising area of Hawke's Bay. The royal train enters the Manawatu Gorge, while a canoe proceeds with more enthusiasm than caution in the swift waters. The four mile gorge is a natural gateway between the mountains. out across the Manawatu Plain and into the square of Palmerston North. Where do they come from, all these people, with only two million in the whole country? Yet this scene is typical of the Queen's reception in more than 50 towns. Mount Egmont, rising 8,000 feet, but not high enough to overawe the children of Stratford. 10,000 have gathered in this dairy farming township, and here the Queen finds herself truly among her people. For Stratford is one of the few places in the Royal Tour where Her Majesty proceeds on foot. And the Duke too. At Bell Block, New Plymouth, the Queen gets an interesting insight into the cooperative dairy industry. No less than a quarter of a million pounds worth of butter and cheese comes out of this factory each year. It is the royal couple's last pause before Wellington. Wellington, a great moment for the 133-year-old capital city, as never before it celebrates, and the greatest, most tumultuous welcome of all is from its children. The organizers have arranged that every child shall have a good view as the Queen and the Duke drive past. But the children find a way to ensure at least two good views. 15,000 individual wills, they build but a single pattern. These are the future men and women of one far corner of a commonwealth of many governments, but of one allegiance. And now, a tribute to the past. The royal couple honor the memory of the dead of two world wars. One hundred and thirty-five thousand New Zealanders served overseas during World War II. Eight won the Victoria Cross. One in every 14 made the supreme sacrifice. It's a gala day for the capital. 
With all the gay colours of a summer throng to greet her, the Queen arrives to open Parliament. She is wearing her fabulous coronation gown. At Westminster, it is traditional that the Sovereign has no right of direct entry into the lower house. In New Zealand, where there is now only a single chamber, the same custom applies. It is to the chamber of the former upper house that the Queen will summon members of the House of Representatives to appear before her. Obeying Her Majesty's order, Major Bryan, Black Rod, backs away to call on the Speaker to lead members into the Queen's presence. The Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition take their places to right and left of the throne. Mr Holland pausing before Her Majesty to present her with the text of the address in Parliament. Honourable members of the House of Representatives, it is with a feeling of real satisfaction that I speak to you, the elected representatives of the people of New Zealand, as your Queen, and that I exercise my prerogative of opening the fourth session of this 30th Parliament. A hundred years ago, when the people of New Zealand gained for themselves the right of responsible self-government, it would have required a prophetic imagination to have foreseen the possibility of the present occasion. But in these hundred years, New Zealand has grown to be a sovereign and mature state, while the ocean surrounding these bountiful islands has become a main highway in a world which has itself been transformed. I wish to express most sincerely, my warm appreciation of the arrangements which my ministers have made for me to travel extensively and to meet my subjects in this country. I pray that the blessing of Almighty God will rest upon your councils. It's the end of a memorable occasion, particularly memorable since it's the first time the ancient ceremony has been recorded on film. The capital city celebrates in style. At the town hall, the Queen carries out her first investiture in her New Zealand capital. The Chief Justice, the Honourable Harold Barraclough, is knighted for services to law and public bodies. He is one of 130 North Islanders rewarded for duties to the community. The Queen's departure for South Island leaves every city from Auckland to Wellington with a feeling of loss. The Royal Plain heads past Wellington towards Cook Strait, the 20 mile gap between the islands. Marlborough Sounds. Here came Captain Cook 184 years ago to make his first landing in the South Island. Main outlet for the Buller coal fields, Westport gives a real mining community welcome. There they are for everyone to see. Bless them. At every wayside station, the children wait in loyalty and excitement. 
The Queen is journeying from the west coast to Canterbury, right across South Island, a magic carpet for every watching child. Ahead lies the Commonwealth's longest railway tunnel, five and a quarter miles through the Southern Alps. Beyond lie precipitous gorges and mountain defiles. The journey through rugged westland to the rich cultivated plains of Canterbury is 148 miles. Christchurch, capital of Canterbury. The cathedral city welcomes its queen. Thirty thousand voices are raised in unison as the mayor calls for cheers. green trees by a sparkling fountain. Where else could the royal couple feel more at home? The scene is the archery lawn at the Botanic Gardens, and 4,000 guests from all parts of North Canterbury have gathered to meet the Queen. Wearing a full-skirted dress of pale mushroom pink lace, the Queen moves among them. 2,000 of the guests are townsfolk who secured their invitation through a public ballot a democratic way of life which delights the Queen. The Duke starts a race at Addington Trotting Course, where meetings have been held for 68 years. 150,000 worth of bets are laid on this course each day. It's a sport which attracts New Zealand's greatest crowds. At Long Beach, an estate founded by John Grigg, a Cornish immigrant of a hundred years ago, the royal couple arrive on a two days visit. Here in the peace of the Canterbury countryside, they will enjoy quiet and seclusion. It's a rest period not begrudged by their most fervent admirers. And now, the South. It's the final lap in the royal journey, and at every vantage point they wait to see her. Even the cot cases are brought from the hospitals. No better medicine. Waitaki Bridge, nearly three quarters of a mile long and a good example of sturdy wooden construction. A rare occasion this, the royal couple just sightseeing for their own pleasure as they travel through land famous for its trout and salmon fishing and seaside beaches. And so she comes to Dunedin, her other Edinburgh, and the packed thousands of us make no secret of our loyalty or emotion. How otherwise could we receive this daughter of a true Scot mother, herself mother of a prince called Charlie, and the Duke of Edinburgh, mark you, father to the prince. Forbury Park, our children await, and we have our own way of keeping them amused. Orderly lines, mark you, and that's what we told them. But who could stop our bairns from paying personal tribute to the Queen? Ah. This is the children's hour. They sweep across the park like the flavouries in a hailing wind. It's a true gale of devotion which blows around them now. At 
Paris Brook Park, the combined pipe bands of Otago show what they can do. It's not only the kilts that make the high spots. Yvette Williams, for example, world's record holder for the women's long jump. <laughs> Nothing could be more fitting for Her Majesty's last public engagement in New Zealand than the opening of the Royal Southland Agricultural Show in Invercargill. I can be cold when there's a southwesterly, but what a chance for the Queen to test the quality of warm New Zealand wool. How completely absorbed she is in the passing cavalcade. How readily she responds to the carefree spirit of our Southland people. The show demonstrates what the richness of farmlands mean to New Zealand and the promise of our youngsters too. Ah, this could go on till the cows come in. The Queen's memories of Southland will forever occupy a very special place. For here it is in the little township of Gore that four-year-old Maureen Lyons presents her bouquet, Upside Down. A right royal president which earns from the Queen the merriest laugh of her whole tour. The appointment of a keeper of royal upside-down bouquets may well be the subject of a future court circular. Now, alas, the time has come for the Queen to depart. Bluff Harbour is the port from which she sails. Aboard the little ships the people crowd, to wish her Godspeed. In the company of her ministers, she walks. She who has invested the crown with a personal quality that we could never have fully understood but for her presence among us. Acting for each one of us in his handshake, the Prime Minister. Sir Willoughby Nori, Governor General. So we take our farewell of her, and loyalty, devotion and pride become merged into one. Now that the moment has come to leave, we do so with sorrow, but we also look forward to the day when we shall once more be able to visit your shores. May God bless New Zealand and watch over the destinies of her people. 12,000 miles she came to us to find home once more and welcome from loyal hearts. That is what New Zealand means to the Queen and she to her New Zealand people.